A warm welcome to all of you. Thank you, Dr. Inglis, as it's probably around 7.30 a.m. in your part of the world. And we thank you deeply for taking the time for this talk. Dr. Inglis's talk today is complementary to an exhibition he has curated at Dakshil Chitra Museum titled Koval Patti, The Town That Papered India. Let me first give you a brief introduction to, Dof to Dr. Stephen Inglis. Dr. Inglis studied anthropology and museology at the University of British Columbia, at Madurai Kamaraj University in Madurai, and at Calcutta University, concluding with a PhD from the UBC in 1984. His field research was undertaken over several years in the late 70s and early 80s with the Tamil Potter Priest. He had a long career at Canada's National Ethnology and History Museum. He worked there as a researcher and curator in ethnology, fine craft, and folk craft before assuming the role of Director General. In this position, Dr. Inglis was responsible for leading Canada's largest research and collections department with holdings of over 3 million artifacts and a professional staff of 130. During his 25-year tenure at the museum, he led the expansion of the international reputation of the institution, its scholars and exhibitions. He curated 10 major exhibitions, notably a survey of Indian art, India the Living Arts in 2000 at the Canadian Museum of Civilization, Maharaja in 2010 at the Art Gallery of Ontario, and the Permanent South Asia Collections in 2011 at the UBC Museum of Anthropology. He is currently an adjunct researcher of art history at Carleton University, where he teaches curatorial studies in Asian art. There he has helped develop a graduate program in curatorial studies. He's been honored for his innovation in museology with awards from the Canadian Museums Association, the Hans Mandeby Foundation of Sweden, the Shastri Indo-Canadian Institute and the President of India. Today's talk is titled, Filling Gaps in the Art of India, where Dr. Inglis will help us understand the influence of a tiny town called Kovilpati in Tamil Nadu and a small band of artists in the area of popular art. And as he says, the ways in which it influenced the ways in which Indians visualize their deities, their politicians and their celebrities. So it's truly a tiny town, but with a national impact, a small band of artists, but again with a national impact. So now over to you, Dr. Inglis. Thank you, Anita. And I thank all of you for uh, showing up this evening for uh, my talk. Um, of course, I couldn't be here without the people of Dakshina Chitra and several people from Kovipati who have uh, really made a, a terif terrific um, contribution to this exhibition and to, I would say, filling in the history of uh, the popular arts in the 20th century. Um, I think I'll begin right away um, with a, um, a, an image, which is a little bit cheeky, um, but I wanted to just say what kind of gaps I'm talking about. Um, the art history of India, of course, is vast, and uh, it's um, something that people have worked on for a very long time. Um, but I'm showing you this just to say that the work of artists like M.F. Hussein on the left of your screen, with his depiction of uh, Lakshmi, and on the right, a uh, depiction of Lakshmi by one of the Kovalpati artists um, sets up a kind of a contrast in the study of the art of India because M.F. Hussain is considered the greatest artist of the 20th century in India. And um, the Kovalpati group uh, are really not well known. Um, so I want to talk uh, tonight a little bit about how I feel the um, the popular arts, the arts for everyday people, um, help to us to understand contemporary art, and also 
fill in some gaps where we don't know who made the these paintings and these pictures and how they did it. I'm going to uh, focus a little bit tonight on what the influences were on the popular artists for popular printing. Uh, it's a very complex history. It's not a very simple thing at all. And I think it's important for us. And what we've tried to do in the exhibit is to bring in some of the influences and the um, inspirations of uh, popular artists. And we're focusing tonight around um, the work and the community uh, gathered together by C. Kondai Raju. Um, as you uh, know, uh, probably by now, he was in a sense the guru of this group starting in the early 20th century and uh, right into the 70s. And he was the tutor and the inspirer of uh, a large group of artists that worked in that small place. Um, so it's the 125th anniversary of his birth today. And I think the small group uh, that is listening to this talk tonight and our, our friends in Chitralium in, in Chennai in particular, your big group, um, uh, we know of this man's history, but very few other people in India do. And um, I think it's important for Dakshina Chitra and for anyone who loves uh, the art of India to become more familiar with this figure. Now, uh, this is a typical kind of uh, photograph um, that one sees of a group. Um, this was very much um, a, a commune, a communal group of artists. And uh, here's the what um, Mr. Jayakumar, who's the son of uh, Ramalingam, uh, called the senior batch. These are the older men who joined with um, Kandai Raju in Kovilpati to begin their work. Uh, first as drama scene painters, then as backdrop painters, uh, then as painters for the big printing companies in uh, Shivakasi. Now, this is the key to uh, both my talk tonight and to um, our understanding of that group of artists, which it's a kind of a genealogy. You see on the left there, the senior batch of artists, all of whom uh, we have uh, work from, uh, the junior batch to the right, who started a little later, and then a whole group of coworkers and assistants at the bottom who assisted with this work. So it's not an insignificant number of people. It's uh, quite a group. And along with uh, many other um, artists in other parts of India, they really produced the style and the volume of uh, work that we know uh, now as uh, the 20th century. I wanted to just say that this kind of work, uh, large scale printing for public um, use started in the, at the turn of the 20th century and really ended toward the end of the 20th century. So I'll get to that uh, in a little more detail in a moment. Now, I just, for those of you who are not from Tamil Nadu, I just wanted to indicate that where we are, we're in uh, Tamil Nadu in the first map in India. And the second map is of Tamil Nadu. And I'm showing you um, the, um, the district uh, in which uh, Kovalpati is located at the very south of um, Tamil Nadu. And then the district, oh, sorry, then a, a little more of the, the area within the district uh, where we find uh, Kovalpati. Now, here's our first look at um, some of the first work coming out of the Devi Art Studio, which was founded by the founding members of the Kovalpati group. This is a, 
a scheme of a background of uh, paintings that were available. Um, and these were sold to photo studios uh, throughout India, uh, even up to Kashmir, uh, where a studio would buy a backdrop of a natural scene or an indoor scene, which they could uh, use as backdrop for the photos they were taking. And I just wanted to throw this in. This isn't members of the Koval Pati group. This is a, a painter and his group called um, Subayar, who worked in Madurai in the 1980s and 70s. And I think he is uh, one of the last drama scene painters still working or was at the time. <laughs> He's actually no more. And this is in a studio right near the Minakshi temple. And um, you can see in the background, it's kind of an interesting photo because it shows how pictures, photographs, uh, and different mementos were framed in the walls of these studios. And um, they represent quite an interesting um, gathering of visual information, which stays on the wall while the work is going on. And here is the group, uh, Subayar and his son and his assistants with one of the big uh, backdrops uh, that they produced for special dramas. These are dramas that um, often called boys companies that went around in Tamil Nadu and to Sri Lanka and to other places in the early 20th century um, doing uh, well-known stories from Hindu epics and uh, from local stories as well. And this was the tradition that the Kovapati artists grew out of, because as some of you are aware, most of the senior batch of Kovapati artists worked for these drama companies uh, earlier on in their career. And uh, they knew the tradition of painting these backdrops. That's how they gained the skill necessary to make it a business. And um, one influence, very important to Kovapati artists, was temple painting, because this was, of course, one of the traditions um, of Tamil Nadu. And uh, this is a temple painter, just a photograph from inside the Minyakshi temple of a group of uh, painters. Uh, their community is Naidu, and uh, they've worked for uh, generations. Uh, in redoing and uh, updating the paintings, the hundreds and hundreds of paintings along the walls of the Minakshi Sundarashvara temple. And uh, I was able to talk with these people. They really begin at one end of the temple and uh, work towards the other end. And uh, they're working for years and years to redo these paintings. And by that time they finish, they have to start again at the beginning because the uh, paintings that they originally did are starting to wear at that point. Now, here's one of the earliest uh, images that I'm aware of, uh, shared with, uh, with me um, of, uh, Kandai Raju's work. So uh, he already had a, a notion of how the goddess should be represented. And uh, this is obviously a um, advertisement. And um, so it's nice to have this very early work because most of the rest of the work from the Kovalpati group comes from uh, his students. And this is another one. I, I just like this image because it's uh, Krishna and Radha, it's a, a Muslim trading company, it's uh, the Hindu temple behind, and then um, I, what I believe is Telugu up above, and just uh, a chance to show the variety of influences and interests in the early, very early um, art, uh, advertising art industry. And uh, Kande Raju signed his name to this uh, particular early piece. Now there's um, myself um, 40 years ago, 
So um, I wish I looked like that now, um, but I'm an old man, and here I'm sitting with uh, M. Ramalingam, one of the greatest artists of the Kovalpati group. And you notice that he seated himself, this is in about 1980, he seated himself beneath a photograph of his guru, Khandaraja. This is important uh, to me because there were certain traditional elements to the Kovalpati group in the sense that a group of artists that gather often uh, have a, a member who is inspiring to the other groups. And I think Kandi Raju was this kind of person. He acted almost as a guru in some ways to the younger artists, helping them out, showing them which direction to go in. And uh, he's honored in that regard by his, um, by his group. There's a lot of traditional Indian thinking in that way of constructing a um, an art group. And um, what this meant was that it's often difficult to tell whether Kande Raju himself worked on a piece or one of his students, because quite often early on in their careers, the artist would sign his name uh, to their work, and then later on both their names to the work. And then as uh, an artist like Ramalingam, who became really a, a, a solid base um, amongst the artists, he would sign his own name eventually and his studio's name. So this was a, a way of acknowledging the master, as it were. Now, this is the, a photograph I took in the 80s of Ramalingam's puja room. And I, I wanted to show you this just because of the a variety of content here. Um, this is the goddess uh, of Kovalpati above, painted by Ramalingam. Then below, a uh, painting of uh, Vinayakar, or Ganapati, um, which Ramalingam told me had been painted by um, Kande Raju. And then on either side, uh, framed uh, prints of uh, work by Raja Ravi Varma, his uh, Lakshmi and his Saraswati, uh, two of the most famous uh, popular images, printed images in the history of uh, popular art. And so it just shows some of the um, some of the influences on his work and some of the veneration that's given to uh, Varma. Uh, by most uh, popular artists in India. Now, I put this together just because on the right you have a um, an image by Ramalinga. It, it's an interesting image because it uh, combines uh, Buddhism and and a uh, uh, beautiful um, uh, Tamil actress, and on the left is an image from Italy, from the turn of the 20th century, uh, of a beauty, an Edwardian beauty. And the image on the left I found in a pile of uh, prints, old prints, in one of the artist studios. So it shows that even early in the 20th century, the, um, the artists, popular artists of uh, South India had access to some European uh, examples of early printed material. And um, it's an interesting vein that runs through. And it also is typical in some ways of the popular arts, this kind of sharing and inspiration back and forth, much less um, uh, concern about that than with uh, most contemporary artists. So it's part of the process that you take in uh, inspiration and adapt it to your own work. Here's um, another rumbling uh, advertising uh, poster for a soft drink company and another beautiful um, uh, actress uh, listening uh, to Krishna 
playing his flute. So this was part of the power of these kinds of images is they combined uh, a sort of a cinema interest with a religious interest. And of course, in Tamil Nadu, it wasn't unusual to have a politician who is also an actress and also a, a religious um, person. And the variety of attractiveness uh, to the general public was enforced and e even made more um, attractive by this kind of combination of ideas. Now, here's another artist. I love this photograph. This is Subaya, uh, the, uh, another uh, very important artist in the Kovalpati group. And this is him probably in about 1946. I think Mr. Uh, Mariswaran uh, guessed at this date, sitting on one of the photo backdrops that must have been popular. You can see the stars in the background and someone might sit just like Subaya is here in the studio on this moon as a, a photo uh, shoot. And <clears throat> just to uh, again, go into the hybridization of uh, Indian art in the popular vein, Here's Gandhi with Buddha and Jesus and Rama all in the same painting. And this was the kind of thing that the popular artists could do, innovating, in a sense, on the older uh, separate views of uh, religious traditions and appealing to the idea that maybe somebody like Gandhi, a politician or, or a, a leader of some kind, was open to the variety of religious traditions that uh, became uh, modern India. And I'm just throwing this one in, a photograph I took in uh, early on in the 80s, um, just showing this kind of tension, I would say, between the female form as goddess and the female form as a, a kind of an attractive temptress. And these two are going on simultaneously, uh, sometimes uh, in the same painting, and but certainly in two different directions that might appeal to some kind of uh, person who was uh, selecting a calendar and not to another. And uh, so <clears throat> the ones on the right, uh, the, the images on the right may be used by small uh, industries and so forth. The ones on the left, most often in the big sweet shops and the big jewelry shops and so forth to represent uh, their uh, devout feelings for the Hindu uh, deities. And along with um, the prints of, uh, for calendars, uh, for cinema and so forth. Sivakasi, which is quite close to Kovalpati, uh, became a place uh, renowned for printing. And here's just an example of the fireworks uh, posters that are done usually each year in the fall. And uh, these drew on the, um, the style of the uh, Kovalpati group and a number of other groups. I, I just wanted to say that... Um, uh, the Kovalpati group is typical of uh, groups of artists who worked in the 20th century. Um, there's many others in, in other parts of India, including, for example, most uh, famously, maybe the painters of Nathwara, who worked for the printers in Mumbai and Bombay, and then individuals, other individuals in North India and West India and so forth. And of course, in Tamil Nadu, too, there were other artists that weren't part of the Kovalpati group, but other really renowned popular artists. I worked a little bit with S. Ravi, with Murugakani. They were both in Sivakasi at the time. And uh, with people like uh, uh, just a whole range, uh, K. Madhavan, 
who I uh, studied his biography and his tradition. So all these various artists contributed to what was being printed in Sivakasi, but the Kovalpati group were the closest and largest uh, generator of these images. And then just one other little printing issue, uh, along with uh, fireworks and matches, um, and all the other printing, um, these little matchboxes, this one particularly beautiful and tiny, uh, were other forms in which the uh, images of the popular artists were distributed. So along with the calendar art, um, there's also, of course, uh, keychains, book covers, and these exchange these images back and forth between different forms and uh, formed a kind of a, a huge paper industry uh, used for practical projects uh, as well as for um, people's in people's homes. One way that I became interested in this, I was working with traditional potters in Madurai and Ramnad district. And I noticed um, every house that I visited, every home, uh, every school, every business uh, had uh, calendar prints, framed or not framed. And I wondered who who's making these, who made these uh, images? Where were they generated? There's a, you know, a sort of a common practice when you look at something that's printed, you think, oh, well, maybe that was just, I don't know, made technically or something. Who? So the actual biography of the artist, the work that went into it, is not so often appreciated. And um, I felt I'd like to find out who these are. And um, many of the potters that I was working with they knew uh, who these artists were. And when they saw the um, the signature on the print, they, they realized this was somebody they knew. And so it was uh, actually one of my closest potter associates who took me down to Kovalpati and introduced me to the artists first because the potters revered <laughs> these artists. Uh, they knew how popular they were and how important what an impression they made on the public. I just wanted to show you this as classical, beautiful image of Minakshi uh, by Subaya. And I just show you another uh, of Ramalingam from his most uh, <clears throat> appreciated period uh, in the 50s and 60s. Here's Murugan. Uh, always the younger Murugan in the south with his veil and his peacock. There's a, <clears throat> a Gopuram in the background, one of uh, Murugan's sacred places, Palani, I think this is, and um, his mother and father, Shiva and Parvati, looking lovingly down on him. Um, some people have called this uh, version of uh, Shiva, an American uh, friend of mine, the Elizabeth Taylor form of Shiva. But in any case, what this is, is something that combines the interest of the local people at the time. Um, their love of Morrigan, their uh, honor of the sacred places where one can visit on pilgrimage, the family grouping. These are all things that appeal to ordinary people in the 20th century and sort of um, made people interested in cutting the, um, the image off the calendar or taking the calendar block off the bottom at the end of the year and maybe framing that painting uh, to act as a shrine in their own home and um, I, I liked um, a comment that I heard from the um, roundtable discussion that happened last week 
um, from a gentleman by the name of Gandhi Balasubramanyam. Uh, he said that there was a certain democratization to the worship of God through images and these kinds of popular images. And in a sense, the gods came home. I, I, I like that because I think that's exactly what was happening. Uh, it enabled people to worship in their own homes uh, deities who may be distant or maybe uh, they didn't feel comfortable with in, in the temple setting. And as a consequence of that, uh, these images and these paper images became a primary form uh, of worship. And in any collection you see of the old prints, there's likely to be little burns from the incense that was burning underneath them, or they've been uh, they've been honored with uh, uh, putu on the, on the forehead. So, and um, my final uh, slide in this little presentation is um, a photograph I took in the early 2000s, I think 2009, uh, this photograph of Srinivasan, who was the last of the senior batch uh, left living in early 2000. And I met him in his studio in Kovapati, and he was uh, painting beautiful uh, painted images on the same size as previously went to Sivakasi for printing. Um, very detailed, beautifully done with that sense of um, the, um, the beauty of, of jewelry and of light and shade and um, in, a, in a kind of a worshipful pose. Um, but he wasn't sending these to uh, Shivakasi because there wasn't the um, there wasn't the attraction, uh, there wasn't the market for them anymore, and he was really just painting these for himself and as a memory of uh, his work during his lifetime. Um, for those of you who aren't aware of Shivakasi. Uh, there was at one time at their height, uh, there was over 400 uh, major presses working in that city, over a thousand letter press units at the same time, it was the major printing uh, hub in India. And um, the numbers uh, of, uh, of pieces that were being um, uh, in 1979, 400 photo offset machines and a thousand litho and letterpress units in operation. And the Kovapati artists, um, Ramalinga, for example, probably did 1600 paintings during the three decades of his most um important period, uh, Subaya, probably more like uh, 1,200. And um, these were printed in runs of thousands, and in some case, tens of thousands, and resulted in millions of images um, printed and passed around uh, around the world. Uh, because they not only were popular in Tamil Nadu, but also in the rest of India and in all the cities around the world where Indians have settled. And um, I wanted to show this photograph as well because of one last um, influence along with the European uh, prints along with the uh, drama backdrops, along with the temple painting. These are the complexities of the influences that went into this style. And on, behind, you see a, a Tanjore 
uh, style painting. And it, it helps us to recall that Conde Raju was a Raju, uh, a group of people that included uh, skilled painters that were brought down to the Tamil kingdoms um, from Andhra and other places, and um, whose tradition was painting some of the first kind of framed paintings that were used in uh, prayer halls and personal residences all through Tamil Nadu. So um, I would just like to do one thing at this point, and that is to, um, oh, I also wanted to mention one other thing I am, I'm forgetting, which is that Sikandai Raju, along with his background as a, from a painter family, um, also attended the um, Madras uh, College of Art and did very well there. And so brought with him a number of other skills uh, that included the study of ancient Indian art and um, also some European art history as well. Um, now, it's important for me uh, to acknowledge the work of uh, Jay Kumar um, Ramalingam and S. Uh, Mariswaran and their relatives in Kovapati who have made the objects that are in the exhibition available. And uh, we've worked very closely with them and appreciate their contributions. I'd also like to thank Anita uh, Patamkulam, who uh, is the culture coordinator at Dakshinichitra and who did a lot of work, Gita Hudson also, and I'm sure many others at Dakshinichitra, which is really a community of museum people who cooperate and support one another. I'd also like to give my special greetings and my thanks to uh, Dr. Deborah Tiagarajan, who was the founder of Dakshina Chitra. And she was the one who opened the door to the study of popular art at Dakshina Chitra and did it a long time ago. She realized that one of the gaps in our consideration of Indian art was this period of time when the uh, popular paper revolution was going on in uh, in, in uh, India in the 20th century. And um, so with that, I thank you for your attention. I hope you'll have a chance to see the exhibition if you're in Tamil Nadu. And uh, if not, there'll probably be some photographic and video uh, documentation that we'll all be able to access. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Inglis, for really taking us through and contextualizing this uh, uh, this period of art uh, that had an influence across uh, India. Um, we are now maybe I just I'll I'll start with a couple of questions after which we'll open it up for for participants. The first question I remember, you know, when growing up and uh, other, we always heard of it as. People also refer to this as Sivakasi art, art from Sivakasi. Mm -hmm. Very clearly referring uh, to it as Kovilpati art. Could you tell us why you so clearly your the, the nomenclature is Kovilpati art? Well, as some of you know, um, Kovilpati almost unexpectedly became a center for this kind of artwork because uh, at a certain point, the companies that uh, Kande Raju and others were working with, drama companies, kind of collapsed. And uh, they were taken over by the radio and by the cinema and by other forms of entertainment, local entertainment. And my understanding is that at a certain point, one of the big companies that these gentlemen were working for uh, sort of broke down and uh, 
maybe went bankrupt, I don't know, but um, they were near Kovalpati and they just decided to put their roots down there. And um, various people who had been uh, colleagues of Kande Raju joined him there. And this is how this large group uh, became centered in Kovalpati. Um, I can see why they call it Sivakasi art because that encompasses uh, a lot, a large percentage of the artists that were working for that, for that field. But Kovalpati became the center for um, the production of the paintings that went to Sivakasi. And during the early period, I, I'm not, hopefully uh, Jayakumar and Marisam will correct me if I'm mistaken, but when they first got to Kovapati, they, they did anything they could. They painted metal trunks. They did all kinds of things that could make them some money until they could establish themselves in other fields. For example, the photo studios that they set up. And from there, they worked out into the print industry in a big way. Um, and another thing that we, you know, we definitely see is that, um, you know, Ravi Verma's oeuvre has received a great deal of scholarly attention. Um, you know, each period, there's someone new studying it and understanding its impact, whereas this has received relatively less. To what do you attribute this overlooking of this, of, of this band of artists? Well, <clears throat> um, I think that Raja Ravi Varma was a real innovator. The other thing is um, that his work started in, he was working for the elite rather than for everyday art. When he began, he was a portraitist and he went from kingdom to kingdom painting people. And, you know, he, he did a lot of oil paintings. <clears throat> of important people and rajas and so forth. And so his name became uh, famous in this way. He also, as you probably know, Anita, set up what was one of the first um, litho printing units in Mumbai very early by importing machines from Europe. And um, so he had a, a kind of a, uh, position within the early 20th century arts, which was quite unique. And um, the Kovalpati group became uh, came on a little bit later after Ravi Varma had already established his uh, position. And I think Ravi Varma was kind of a personality and he was one that was associated with the British and with the, with the ruling uh, parties and classes and uh, that's probably why he uh, he also made some innovations this painting of uh, Puranic stories and so forth which hadn't been a big part of Indian art up to that time he innovated with so um, yeah those are some of the reasons you're right there's been a lot of publications and writing and most famous artist in the history of India and so forth applied to Ravi Varma. But of course, he was just one of the early artists contributing oh. to 20th century um, interest in uh, popular painting. Um, I'll, I'll read out a couple of questions that have come from the participants. One from Harini, she's asked, if technology today has enhanced the creative space or otherwise, it's a general question. And another from uh, Visalakshi Ramaswamy who asks, what is the future plan to continue this tradition? I know it's a very difficult question to answer, but that's a question. Well, <clears throat> from my experience, uh, it does seem like this original painting for printing is uh, is a sort of a system that's more or less fallen apart. Um, as you may know, the um, printers, the big ones, 
Coronation, and these big litho companies in Sivakasi, they purchased the original artwork from the artists to a large extent. Uh, now, um, luckily, the descendants of those artists uh, have been able to gather quite a collection of original paintings, but most of the paintings, like the one that's um, uh, Srinivasan is working on in my last slide, most of those uh, went to the printers. And then the printers had retouchers on staff, painters who would take the backgrounds and change the color, add another figure to the painting and so forth, so that it could be reprinted again. And finally, as the digital age came upon us, these printers had all the paintings they needed along with photography and other forms of uh, popular imagery, they didn't need the artists anymore to a large extent. So this big production uh, more or less came to the end. Um, the other thing that happened was people didn't need calendars anymore. <laughs> as soon as the cell phone came into use, the calendar became a kind of an anachronism. Uh, you might still hang it on your wall, but it didn't have the functional use that it used to. Um, so I don't see a big future in this. I think the era of the papering of India, as I called the exhibit, is over. Um, however, I think learning about the traditions of these artists and what went into that huge image world of the 20th century is an important part of Indian art history. And I think its future is to become better known and better appreciated within the full realm of Indian art. Thank you for that, because uh, you've also sort of you know, said that something when something is over, it's over, but it's still very important for us to to learn, appreciate, understand all the nuances of everything. There's a question from Deborah Tyagarajan. It's did the younger members of the group have anything to do with the huge film posters which were so popular at the end of the 20th century? Yes, they did. Um many of the Koville Party artists did um film poster work. Um, not so much as some of the others in other parts of the state, but um, yes, uh, for sure they did. And as um, those of you who are a Tamil uh, know, um, quite often these uh, posters for cinemas were, were very important to the attraction of the film. And uh, sometimes uh, a poster would be put up partially and then the painter would come overnight and paint another part of it. And then, you know, there were there were a whole range of different uses for these um, for these images. But as I've said, if you look at the more contemporary film uh, advertising, uh, it's almost all photographic and um, uh, the digital age has not been kind to um, these creative traditions. And um, as a result, I'm sure some people who were painting are doing other things now. And um, we're just kind of appreciating now to a larger extent what happened uh, to Paper India with these wonderful images and all the uses to which they were put. One of which, as I've argued, um, is that through the work of these artists, these were the images through which ordinary people visualized their gods and visualized their politicians and visualized their movie stars. So it was the uh, poses, the colors, the representation that these artists did, which gave people a visual contact and a visual image uh, to help set up their version of the world. 
And I think that's perhaps the greatest legacy of uh, this artistic tradition. And we must not forget that it's most apt today that we've had the, the talk today because today is the 125th birth anniversary of Kondai Raju. So, yes. You know, so. And isn't that lovely, Anita, yeah. that we can celebrate uh, yes. someone who was so influential uh, during his time, and yet very few Indians have ever heard his name. Yes. And, uh, you know, as a consequence of that, I think it is filling in gaps in, uh, in the tradition of Indian art. Um, so I, I think we've come to the end. Um, I, I don't know whether Jay Kumar and, and group maybe are just soaking in what you have said. Um, there were a couple of questions that probably came from some of them. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Inglis, for this talk. And thank you for filling in the gaps. And uh, it's also very heartening for us to be able to do it on the 125th birth anniversary of Kondai Raju. Thank you all for tuning in today. And um, please catch us at our next DC Museum Talks. Good night. Uh, Anita? Yes? Could I say one more thing? Oh, please, please do. I just wanted on the 125th uh, anniversary of Kande Raju to say thank you to the people at Chitralian. Mm -hmm. This is an art gallery in Chennai, which looks at the work and legacy of these important artists. And I just like to acknowledge the fact that this work is going on and it's a younger generation which is appreciating and uh, gathering and uh, distributing the work of their elders. Thank you. Yes, and I must add, uh, Dr. Inglis, that it is standing room only at the Chitralium Gallery today. <laughs> I hear that the, the, the gallery is full and people are standing outside and listening to the talk now. So, I mean, the younger Thank generation... Thank you so much. Younger <laughs> generation... That's wonderful. Yeah, they're very aware that they have to safeguard and keep these legacies... Uh, and these narratives and these stories alive. Thank you so much, Dr. Inglis. And okay. we hope to see you in Chennai for a physical talk.